Well, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's great to be here with you. And uh, my favorite title that I have in all the world is Grandfather, uh, Grandpa. So they call, me, uh, they call me Big G. So that's my favorite title in all the world. So all the other things I have uh, just are come, come beneath that. But um, such a privilege to be here uh, with you tonight. I, I've uh, admired your pastor, Dr. Evans, from afar for many years. And I've just gotten to know him here in uh, recent times. And uh, you all are so fortunate to have him as your pastor. And I'm fortunate to be here tonight. Amen. He's uh, a real blessing to the body of Christ. He's been a blessing in my life. I have a lot of his books, and I love to listen to his preaching. And so, I mean, I'm fortunate to be here tonight. It's a great blessing. And thank you all so much for coming out on a Wednesday night uh, to study God's Word together in, in, in Bible prophecy. Um, as uh, was mentioned, I'm from Oklahoma, and um, Oklahoma is known for three things. We're known for oil. Uh, we're also known for football. We love football in Oklahoma, just like here in Texas. Now, I'm a massive Dallas Cowboys fan. Um, the, uh, I grew up in Oklahoma. We don't have a pro team there. So every Sunday, the Dallas Cowboys are on. And so I love the Dallas Cowboys. You know, I heard about a man recently who uh, was dying, and he said he wanted to have four Dallas Cowboy players be the pallbearers at his funeral. Somebody said, well, why would you want that? And he said, so they can let me down one last time. <laughs> About, uh, well, they've been letting us down lately. I mean, it's uh, being a Cowboys fan was great for about the first 30 years, but these last 30 years haven't been so good. But there's always this coming season, right? So hopefully it'll be good. But uh, the other thing that Oklahoma is known for, unfortunately, is not a, a great thing, but is tornadoes. Uh, we're known for a lot of tornadoes up there. In fact, that movie Twister, you know, years ago was filmed there. But um, I've seen a lot of tornadoes in my time in Oklahoma, but one stands out above all the rest. Uh, on the evening of May the 3rd, 1999, um, a tornado in southwest Oklahoma metastasized into a, a monster cyclone, and it thundered to the northeast. I mean, it effortlessly flattened a 60-mile swath of territory of town after town and neighborhood after neighborhood. I, I watched on TV as it formed down near Apache, Oklahoma, and headed up towards the Oklahoma City area. Uh, when this uh, steamroller finally ran out of, of, of energy, it had destroyed 1,500 homes, damaged over 8,000 homes, and killed 44 people. A 95% of the town of Mulhall, Oklahoma, was destroyed. Now, after the storm, meteorologists determined the wind speed generated peaked at 318 miles an hour. It's the highest winds ever recorded on planet Earth. In fact, they don't even have a, you know, they, they have F0 to F5 tornadoes. This was an F6. It's the largest uh, tornado or the, the highest winds ever. And a few days after that, I had the, the opportunity to view some of the damaged area in person. And I was stunned. It looked like a, a scene out of some apocalyptic movie. Um, there was uh, all the grass had even had been sucked out of the ground. I mean, think about that. Bermuda grass was sucked out of the ground uh, b by the wind. It left areas, large swaths of, of just dirt, you know, exposed all over the place. Now, as overwhelming as this F6 tornado was, the, the Bible tells us uh, that someday God is going to leash, unleash His own tornado of judgment on this world, a an F6 tornado of devastating judgment, and it's a, a time period uh, that the Bible calls uh, the tribulation. And uh, my topic tonight that uh, Dr. Evans has asked me to speak on, it's uh, just a small topic, um, the tribulation, Armageddon, and the second coming. So that's what we're going to try to cover tonight. I wanted to ask him, do you want me to just go ahead and finish out with the millennium and uh, heaven? But uh, so we've got a lot to cover tonight, but, but there's, there's really not any more sobering, serious topics than this in the, in the Word of God. Yet at the same time, there's nothing more hopeful for God's people, because the Bible tells us Jesus is coming back someday to end it all. He's going to end all of this and, and make things right. Uh, Jesus is going to come back as the last Adam to do what the first Adam failed to do, to take dominion over this earth and to rule and reign. So he's going to bring peace and prosperity to this earth. There's going to be a, a happy ending. But according to the Bible, it's going to get a lot worse uh, before it gets better. Now, we've got a lot of ground to cover tonight. So before we dive in, I want to kind of get our prophetic bearings a little bit and just do a, a little bit of review. So let me put up this uh, first slide. Is, that, uh, is this working? Is it, oh, there it is. All right, here we go. Um, uh, hopefully, a, a picture will speak a thousand words here. I know last you've you spoken the last few times about the rapture and the Antichrist, and we'll talk a little bit more about the Antichrist tonight. But 
You can see on this, this chart here on the far left side, where we are right now is called the current church age. By the way, this is a chart I got from a, a book from uh, Tommy Ice and Tim LaHaye called Charting the End Times. If you see me with a chart that looks this good, I didn't make it myself. So this is a chart from that book. It's a really, really helpful book. But we're on that far left side right now. We're in the current church age where the stage is being set for the future events that will take place. And the next event, I believe, on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture of the church. Now, you've talked about this. There's people date the, uh, place the rapture at different places. What I hold to is called the pre-tribulation rapture view. Christ is going to come pre or before the tribulation in a moment in a twinkling of an eye to catch those who are alive on the earth to heaven, and those who've died, their bodies will be resurrected and rejoined uh, with their perfected spirits. So I believe that's the next event on God's prophetic calendar. Again, some people put the, the, the rapture at the middle of the tribulation or the end of it, but the view that, that I hold and Dr. Evans holds is called the, the pre-tribulation rapture view. So one of these days, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to get an airlift accompanied by a facelift. I mean, we're going to get a new body, a glorified, immortal, imperishable, incorruptible body in a moment of time. And after the rapture takes place, you can see on this chart, there's going to be a time of what I call further preparation. The stage is going to be set further. Now, we don't know everything that will happen during that time, but we know that the stage will be set. Now, when we're caught up to heaven, we're going to go to heaven and we're going to experience something called the judgment seat of Christ, where as believers, our life's going to be reviewed and we're going to be rewarded or receive lack of reward based on our service for the Lord. And then there's going to be the marriage of the bride, the church, to Jesus Christ. We'll be uh, married to Him. So the rapture of the church, this next event on God's prophetic calendar, is going to set the entire end-time prophetic program into motion. Now, meanwhile, down here on earth, a seven-year period of time called the tribulation period is going to begin to unfold. And so what I want to do tonight, I've got three simple points. You can write these down as we go along to kind of take us through the, the uh, tribulation, the second coming, and Armageddon. I want to look at the commencement of the tribulation, what's going to start it, the course of it, and again, we'll just be able to kind of hit a few high points, and then the culmination of the tribulation. What's going to happen at the end? That's going to be the campaign of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ. So let's look at the commencement here of the tribulation. Now, the first thing I want to tell you is, is why do we call this time period the tribulation? Well, we do it because Jesus called it that. I mean, Matthew 24, verse 9, Jesus said, then they will deliver you to tribulation. So from that statement there, we get this idea of a tribulation. In Matthew 24, verse 21, Jesus said, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. So that ought to tell you something about this period of time. It's going to be an unparalleled time of judgment uh, upon, uh, upon the earth. Now, another title you may run across in the Bible for this period of time, it's called the Day of the Lord. Nineteen times in the Old Testament you find that. Four times uh, you see it in the New Testament. So you'll notice here on this chart that I've got again, if you'll look there, you'll notice the rapture takes place, then there's going to be a time of further preparation, but notice there the event that starts the seven-year tribulation is a treaty, a peace treaty that the Antichrist is going to sign with the nation of Israel. So here's an important point to remember, the rapture doesn't start the seven-year tribulation period. The purpose of the rapture is to end the church age. So the rapture will end the church age, and then sometime after that, the tribulation will start. Now, we don't know if it'll be the next day, a week, a week after it, a month after it, or a year after it. There'll be some gap of time, and the Antichrist is going to come on the scene, and he's going to make this covenant or a treaty with Israel uh, for seven years, and it's going to be a peace treaty. Now, one of the things that tells us is if the Antichrist is going to make a peace treaty with Israel, Israel has to exist, Right? Well, they do. Since 1948, 1948, uh, uh, six of the Jews in the world lived in Israel. Today, it's over 40 percent of the Jews in the world live in Israel. So, I call the, the, the regathering of the Jewish people to their land in Israel the super sign of the end times, because so many of these other events of the end times are contingent upon Israel uh, being in the land. 
So again, we're not going to have time to turn to all these verses. You can write them down as we go along. But in Daniel 9.27, it tells us that the Antichrist is going to come and he's going to make a, a covenant for seven years with the Jewish people. And this covenant is going to allow them to rebuild their Jewish their, their temple on that 36-acre temple mount in Israel. Have any of you ever been over to Israel before? Any of you all ever been on an Israel trip? You know, if you've been up there on that temple mount, it's the, the most sacred 36 acres in the world. That's where um, Abraham went and took Isaac to, to offer him as a sacrifice. Um, the, there's many people in Israel today that are preparing for this. Uh, the, the, the Temple Institute in Israel is preparing for a rebuilt temple and to begin to offer their sacrifices again. Now, the duration of this tribulation period is seven years. It's uh, Daniel 9.27 tells us that. As you read through the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, over and over again, you'll find the time period of 1,260 days, 42 months, or time, times, and half a time. All of those are the same way of saying three and a half years. The Jewish people used a, a 360-day prophetic calendar. So 42 months, 1260 days, time is one, times is two, and a half a times a half. All those are three and a half years. And they all look at that last half that you can see up here of that, that seven-year uh, period. So the Antichrist is going to rise and be a, the dominant figure on earth during the tribulation. I mean, he's a major figure in Bible prophecy. There are over a hundred passages in the Bible that tell us about the Antichrist. You know, sometimes people today say, well, who cares about the Antichrist? You know, we're not going to be here when he's on earth anyway. Well, the Bible talks a lot about him and wants us to know who he is. He's, he's going to be Satan's CEO. Um, one of my friends describes him as Satan with skin on. I mean, he's going to be a man who's going to be indwelled and possessed by Satan. And people are going to clamor after him. He's going to be the, the, the Messiah the world's been waiting for. Uh, one man j named John Phillips, he puts it like this. This is really a, a descriptive uh, uh, passage here. He says, the world will go delirious with delight at his manifestation. He'll be the seeming answer to all its needs. He'll be filled with all the fullness of Satan, handsome with a charming devil-may-care personality, a genius superbly at home in all the scientific disciplines, brave as a lion with an air of mystery about him, to tease the imagination, to chill the blood as the occasion may serve, a brilliant conversationalist in a score of tongues, a soul-captivating order. He will be the idol of all mankind. That's just one who's coming. Now, let me just answer a couple questions. I don't know if Dr. Evans mentioned these points or not, but could he be an American, even an American president? People have wondered about that ever since, you know, John F. Kennedy, people thought he was the Antichrist because he was a Catholic. Uh, people thought Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist because his three names each had six letters in them, Ronald, Wilson, Reagan, 666. People thought Bill Clinton was the Antichrist. Uh, people thought President Obama was the Antichrist. Of course, a lot of people thought Donald Trump was the Antichrist. <laughs> But he's not going to be an American. The, the Bible says in Daniel 9.26, he's going to come from the same people who destroyed the Jewish temple in 70 A.D. Of course, that's the Romans. Now, I don't think necessarily it means he's an Italian, but he's going to come from the confines of the Roman Empire. You know, some have also wondered, well, could the Antichrist be a Muslim? Because of all the rise in Islam in the Middle East um, in the last uh, a couple of decades. Well, in the Bible, it tells us the Antichrist, when he comes, is going to declare himself to be God, declare the whole world to worship him. Well, well, the main tenet of Islam is there's one God, Allah, and his prophet is Muhammad. So, obviously, the Antichrist can't be a Muslim because he's going to defy the main tenet of Islam and declare that he is God. People ask, was well, the Antichrist alive today? Well, we don't know because we don't know when the tribulation will start. Now, if the tribulation is going to start in the next 20 or 30 years, we would assume that he's alive somewhere um, on the earth today. But one thing we can know, I believe there's always an Antichrist alive somewhere on the earth. I think Satan always has someone ready because he doesn't know when God's program is going to swing into action. So he's always got somebody ready, waiting in the shadows, waiting in the wings, to come on the scene. Now, I always say, don't try to figure out who the Antichrist is. He's called in Daniel 7 a little horn, which means he's going to rise insignificantly. So anybody you'd look around today and say, maybe that person's the Antichrist is not the person because he's going to arise from insignificance. 
So I don't believe we will know who He is. I don't think He'll be revealed until after the rapture, until after the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit through the church is removed. So trying to figure out who the Antichrist is right now is jumping the gun. I like to say, if you ever do figure out who the Antichrist is, I've got bad news for you. You've been left behind. So <laughs> you don't want to know who the Antichrist is. But he's going he's gonna to emerge on the world scene as a man of peace. He's going to be a man with a plan. You can imagine after the rapture, people disappearing all over the, uh, all over the world. There's going to be chaos. And Chuck Swindoll describes the rise of the Antichrist after the rapture like this. He says, this man will emerge after the rapture probably to calm the chaotic waters, troubled by the unexplained departure of so many Christians. He'll be primed and ready to speak. He'll stand before not only a nation but a world and will win their approval. Like Hitler, he will emerge on a scene of such political and economic chaos that the people will see him as man with vision, with pragmatic, answer, pragmatic answers and power to unite the world. So he's going to come on a platform of world peace. He's going to guarantee Israel's security. Um, he'll solve the Middle East peace problem. Um, he'll probably win the Nobel Peace Prize. He'll probably be Time's Man of the Year. And interestingly, what we see in the world today is preparing for this peace treaty. Have you all heard of the Abraham Accords? Um, you know, Israel's uh, entered into agreements now with Bahrain and United Arab Emirates and Morocco and Sudan. They already have peace from the late 70s with Egypt and from the early 90s with Jordan. Now, none of this we see today is the fulfillment of this prophecy but it's a foreshadow of it. We can see the, uh, the, the foreshadow of what's coming. And uh, right now, as we speak, President Biden is in Israel, and he's going to be going to Saudi Arabia. And some people believe they may be able to broker a peace between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And that would be dramatically significant. So the stage is being set and being set up for the Antichrist. So all that has to happen is for the rapture to take place, and everything's going to swing into motion. So the event that commences the tribulation is the seven-year covenant the Antichrist signs with the nation of Israel. That's when the seven years will begin. Now let's talk about the course of the, of the tribulation. What's going to happen during this seven-year period? Well, let me just again, I'm not going to turn to these different passages. It'll otherwise kind of just be a glorified sword drill here tonight, looking at passage after passage. But let me just have you think with me about the book of Revelation for a moment. If you open up the book of Revelation, again, you can write these things down if you want. But in chapter 1, you have a revelation of Jesus Christ. The radiant, resurrected Christ appears to the apostle John. So I call Revelation chapter 1 the Christ. Chapter 2 and 3 are seven letters that Jesus wrote to seven churches. So I call that the churches. And then chapter 4 to the end is the consummation. It's future, still to today. Now, the event there in chapter 4 and 5 that, that kind of sets up the book of Revelation is God the Father is seated on a throne, and He has a scroll in His right hand, a scroll that's written on the front and the back, and it's sealed with seven seals. And nobody's found worthy to open the scroll except the lamb who is slain, who's also the Lion of Judah. Now, there's all kinds of debate on what is this seven-sealed scroll. The only document in that day we know of that was sealed with seven seals was a will, uh, the inheritance. And so, this seven-sealed scroll that Jesus takes from God the Father is the inheritance of the nations of the earth. And so the book of Revelation, in the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus begins to open the seals on that seven-sealed scroll. And once that scroll is opened, you get to chapter 19, Jesus returning back to the earth, and then Him setting up His kingdom and taking the inheritance uh, that He's been given. And so this seven-sealed scroll that Jesus has, He begins uh, to open. Um, let's see, these out of… Um, should be one more. Oh, there we are. So, these uh, seal judgments, the, the, the seals begin to be opened on this seven-sealed scroll. And what you have in the book of Revelation, starting in chapter 6 and going forward, is three series of seven judgments. So, you have seven seals. Then what we're going to find out is when Jesus finally opens the seventh seal, the seventh seal is going to contain seven trumpets. And then when the seventh trumpet is blown, the seventh trumpet is going to contain seven bowls. 
So all this judgment is finally poured out. The scroll's opened. Jesus gets the inheritance, and He's going to come back as King of kings and Lord of lords uh, to rule and reign. But you can see here these, these seals, what they are. Uh, the, the, the first seal is a rider on a white horse. Now, this isn't Jesus. This is the Antichrist. Rides forth at the beginning of the tribulation, riding a white horse, just like Jesus will do in Revelation 19. He's a false Christ. And then you have a rider on a red horse, which is wars and rumors of wars. A rider on a black horse, which speaks of famine and hyperinflation that's coming. Does it remind you of anything that's happening these days? Again, what we see happening today is not the fulfillment, but it's the setup for these things. It says it's going to take everything you can, you, you can make just to buy food to put on the table. Uh, the fourth seal is a, a rider on a pale horse, and he rides out and it says he has authority to kill one-fourth of the earth. Twenty-five percent of the people die just in that fourth seal judgment. And one of the, one of the things that, that's uh, used there to take people's lives is pestilence or disease. We're seeing all kinds of diseases now, you know, and all these diseases come from animals. Uh, and it says there in Revelation chapter 6, verse 8, that these diseases come from the wild beasts of the earth. And that's what we're seeing today. It's from, you know, monkey pox to, you know, West Nile virus to, um, you know, the uh, COVID uh, that comes from, you know, possibly from animals, you know, all these diseases now coming from animals that are killing people. And then we have the fifth seal that's martyrdom, and then these cosmic disturbances. And then finally you get to uh, chapter uh, 8 of the book of Revelation, the, the, seal, the seventh seal is opened, and the seventh seal contains uh, seven trumpet judgments, seven trumpets that are unfolded. Now, what happens at the beginning, at the middle of the tribulation, that first half of the tribulation, the Antichrist has this peace with Israel, but at the middle of that period of time, the Antichrist is going to break his treaty uh, with the nation of Israel, and all hell's going to break loose, or we could say all heaven's going to break loose. It's going to be one of the great double crosses of all time. He's going to double cross uh, the people of Israel, and now he's going to become their enemy uh, rather than their friend. And the Antichrist is going to set up a global empire. You can read about it in Revelation 13. He's going to rule the world economically, he's going to rule the world politically, and he's going to rule the world religiously. Everyone's going to have to bow down and declare that he is God. If they don't do that, then they're not going to be able uh, to buy or to sell. And you all have heard before about the mark of the beast, right? Everybody's going to have to take this mark. It's, it's 666. And that's literally the numerical value of the Antichrist name. So when people take that mark on the right hand or their forehead, they're going to literally be taking the Antichrist name on them. It's going to be the, the, uh, the, the uh, trademark for, for commerce, the passport for global commerce. And if you don't bow down and worship the Antichrist and take his mark, then you're cut out of the economy of that day. And you think about what we see today in our world, how it's being set up towards globalism. I mean, all the technology that we have today that allows people to be tracked and traced and surveillance. And, um, you know, they're coming out now with digital currencies. Um, China has a digital currency. Um, here in America, um, it's just, um, they're, they're investigating a central bank digital currency. If you have a digital currency, they can program where you spend every dollar. I mean, they can track where you spend every dollar, and they can program where you spend your money. In other words, you can spend this much on gas, this much on food. Uh, if they don't want you to give to a local church or a ministry, you can't give money there. I mean, once they get control over people's money and the economy, then it's not long before there's political troll, control and there's religious control. So that last three and a half years of the tribulation period is going to be the time dominated by the Antichrist as he rules and reigns. You know, history began with the sin of man. It's going to end with the man of sin as he comes to rule uh, the world. Now, one comment about the mark of the beast I'll make quickly, and that is whenever you think about the mark of the beast, nothing today is the mark of the beast. You know, people think, you know, the COVID vaccine was the mark of the beast, or, you know, people ask me sometimes, you know, what if they come out with a, with a, a, a national identification card? Could that be the mark of the beast? Nothing today is the mark of the beast because we're not in the tribulation period yet. We've got to be in the last half of the tribulation. Also, nobody will take the mark of the beast accidentally. It's like you're just kind of accidentally taking it and say, oh, no, I didn't know I was taking it. No, you're going to knowingly take it 
because those who take it then are going to be doomed. Once you take it, you're doomed. People will make a choice between Christ or between Antichrist. It's going to be a crisis time when they, when they make that choice. And those who take uh, the, the mark of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast upon them, uh, they're going to be doomed, uh, the Bible tells us in, in uh, Revelation chapter 14. So during this second half of the tribulation, while the Antichrist kingdom is, is, is formed on the earth, then we have the next series of judgments. The, the seventh seal contains seven trumpets. And again, uh, you have a, a four plus three pattern. The first four are set apart from the last three with the seals. The first four are these four horsemen of the apocalypse, the, the red, white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse. Now, these, are, these trumpet judgments are, are devastating judgments that come upon different parts of the earth. And you'll notice if you, if you read uh, Revelation chapter 8 and 9, that's where these trumpet judgments are, that each of them just affect a third of the earth. They, it's upon the rivers. It's a third of the rivers and a third of the sea. In the sixth trumpet judgment, one-third of the people on the earth are killed. It's an army of 200 million. I don't think it's a human army. Some do. I think it's a demonic army. It kills a third of the people on the earth. So think about this. Just with the fourth seal, the, the uh, sixth, um, or the, the fourth seal judgment and the sixth trumpet judgment, in just those two judgments, that's half the people on the earth. A fourth and then a third. This is going to be a a time that we can't even really wrap our mind around about the devastation uh, that's going to be on the earth uh, during this period of time. The fact that these these trumpet judgments, though, only affect a third of the earth, we don't know what third it will be, but one of the things that shows us is that this isn't just some man-made disaster. If it's just climate change or different things happening, you know, it would would affect different parts of the earth. It's a third, a third, a third. In other words, this is being sovereignly controlled and directed by God Himself. And there's a lot of parallel between these judgments and the plagues of Egypt back in the book of Exodus. And back in the book of Exodus, the plagues, uh, they weren't just caused by natural disasters. They were being brought by God Himself. So these are going to be judgments that God Himself um, is, uh, is unleashing, I believe, uh, upon the earth. And then when you get to the, to the end of this time of tribulation, there's seven more judgments, seven bold judgments. And again, these are so severe that they can't last very long. So I think the seal judgments are during that first three and a half years. The trumpet judgments are the last three and a half years. And then right at the very end, these bowls uh, are, are poured out. And uh, you can see there again, you can look at these, how devastating they are. And they're very similar again to the plagues uh, of Egypt. And I'll comment on that here in just a moment. Now, I know what some of you are probably, probably wondering at this point. This is a good question. Why is God going to send a time like this on the earth? I mean, why would a God who loves us send a time of devastation like this upon the planet He created? Well, let me just give you four thoughts about this. One is, I believe God will use the tribulation period to purge the nation of Israel. Uh, The Jewish people, by and large, have have turned their back on their God. They've turned their back on their Messiah. And God is going to use this time of tribulation to, to put them in the vice, if you will, Well, they'll turn to Him as their their Savior and their God. Jesus said in Matthew 23 that one condition for His return to the earth, now not the rapture, but His return we're going to talk about here a little bit later, the end of the tribulation, His second coming, is the Jewish people have to repent. The Jewish people have to turn to Him. What did Jesus say at the end of Matthew 23? He said this to the Jewish nation, you will never see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They'll never see him again. So God is going to put them in a place where they're going to turn to him. They're going to seek him. And they're going to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And when they turn and they repent at the end of that tribulation period, God is going to send Jesus back. He's going to send their Messiah. There's a, there's a passage in, in Isaiah 64, uh, verse 1, that's so powerful. It's really the, what, the, what the, the Jewish people, the, the remnant's going to be saying in the end times. They say, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. They're going to be calling on Him uh, to come, and God's going to open their eyes. Zechariah 12 says they're going to look upon me whom they pierced. They're going to mourn for Him like one mourns for an only son. 
So God's going to send the tribulation to purge Israel. He's going to also send the tribulation just to punish sin. We won't have time again to look at the passages, but you'd think with all this happening, you'd think what would people be doing? They'd be falling on their face before God and repenting and calling out to God to save them. But as you go through the book of Revelation again and again, you can see it up here on the, the slide, the response in Revelation 16, verse 9, verse 11, verse 21, they blaspheme God. Rather than being horrified by what's happening, they're hardened and it just shows again, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful uh, picture, a portrayal of the depravity and wickedness of the human heart apart from God's work in our lives. And the third thing the tribulation is going to do, it's going to prove the power of God. Remember back uh, when God came and, and told Pharaoh, let my people go, what Pharaoh say? I'm, who's God? <laughs> who's God that I should let the people go to serve him? So God says, well, I'll tell you what, I'll show you who I am. God unleashes the, the plagues. And when you get to the end times, it's going to be kind of like the same thing. God's going to come and say, um, I want you to turn to me and repent. And the Antichrist is going to say, who's God that I should serve him? So God's going to say, you know what? A guy said that a few thousand years ago. We're just going to rerun the game film again and, and do the same thing. So you see how many of these plagues in the end time are just like the plagues of Egypt. It's going to be God, again, showing a, 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 a rejecting Christ, rejecting world who he is. And then a final reason for the tribulation is to provide salvation, to provide salvation. Revelation chapter 7, you have 144,000 Jewish men there who are saved, and then you have a, a, a number of Gentiles that you can't even count at so many of them. And so I like to say that there's going to be great revival during the great tribulation. At the darkest time in human history, our gracious God is still going to be seeking and saving uh, those who are lost. And I think the rapture may be one of the greatest evangelistic tools in human history. I think about people disappear all over the world, and you know, a lot of people are going to show up for church on Sunday and find out they're the only one there, just a few folks with them. And the people are going to turn to Christ during that time, I believe. Now, some of you may say, well, I'll just wait then and see if the tribulation starts, and I'll get saved then. That's not a good idea. First of all, none of us know how much time we have personally or prophetically, right? Personally, I don't know when I'm going to die. Prophetically, Christ could come at any moment. Let me just say this. It's not going to get easier after the rapture to get saved. It's going to get harder. The Antichrist is going to unleash a reign of terror against, uh, against those who serve the Lord. So don't wait. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, come to Him tonight. So, I mean, we could uh, go on and on about what the tribulation will be like, but let's get to these last two events. So I call this the, the culmination or the consummation or the climax of the tribulation. Uh, there's two events that will consummate uh, the tribulation period, the campaign of Armageddon and the coming of Christ. Those are the final two events. And again, we'll go back to our original chart here. Again, you can see there now on the far right side, after this seven-year period, the first three and a half years, and then those last three and a half, it's going to end with the campaign of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so, the campaign of Armageddon is going to take place in the land of Israel. That's where it's all going to come down. I mean, in Revelation chapter 16, it's the only time in the New Testament you have the word Armageddon. And again, if you've been to Israel, you know that the word Armageddon in Hebrew, Har is mountain, and Megiddon is Megiddo. So it's Mount Megiddo up in the northern part of Israel. Now, we think of a mountain, we think of you know, like the Rockies or you know, some mountain, you know, thousands of feet high. This is just a little raised hill, little raised area. But it overlooks a valley uh, that's 20 miles long and 14 miles wide. And that's called the, the Valley of Jezreel or, or the Valley of Megiddo. You can see a picture of it here from uh, the mountain that's here. Uh, Napoleon called it uh, the, the world's ideal battlefield. And all the forces of the world are going to be gathered there at the end of the tribulation period. Now, we don't know why they gather there for sure. The Bible doesn't tell us. Some thinks they, they gather there to, to fight the Antichrist, but it says that demonic spirits go out to gather the armies together. Well, these demonic spirits wouldn't gather people to fight against the Antichrist because he's on their side. Um, some people say they're gathering there to fight against Jesus because they know he's returning soon. 
What makes most sense to me is they gather there in the land of Israel kind of in one final attempt to annihilate the Jewish people once and for all. Because you see, God has made promises to the Jewish people. He's made covenants with them. And Satan couldn't prevent Jesus from coming and dying on the cross, so he's moved now to plan B, which is to wipe out the Jewish people and to thwart the promises that God has made to them. So Satan's the ultimate anti-Semite who wants to wipe out the Jewish people to thwart God and keep God from keeping His promises. But in Revelation 16, it talks about the Euphrates River being dried up to make the way, prepare the way for the kings from the east to come in. Uh, to, the, to the land of Israel. And again, that's the only place you find the word Armageddon mentioned. Uh, one other passage um, you might uh, have read at some point in time that I think refers to Armageddon, this is really a sobering passage. In uh, Revelation 14, it says in chapter 14, verse 19, the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of it. It's actually there 184 miles. Now, that's the, the, really the length of the land of Israel. So this campaign of Armageddon, as these armies gather there to annihilate the Jewish people once and for all, it's going to engulf the whole land. They'll gather up there in northern Israel at Armageddon, but it's going to spill over all the way down. Uh, to the city uh, of Jerusalem uh, as well. Now, when it says that blood came out to the horses, up to the horse's bridle for 184 miles, when I was a, a boy and I used to hear prophecy teachers talk about this, they would say, you know, blood's going to flow up to the horse's bridle for 184 miles. Now, I wasn't the smartest kid in the world, but I'd think, man, that's a lot of blood. You know, I mean, how's that going to, I mean, that, how, much, you know, how much blood is there in one person, you know, to, to fill, you know, this area of th that large with blood? Now, it's, it's possible that you could take this literally, but the way I take it is he's using an image here of a wine press. If you've seen a wine press, it's usually a little bit off the ground, and they put grapes there, and people get in there and stomp the grapes, and then the juice goes out down a little area and gathers there, and they make wine from that. What I think he's saying here is the, the wine, it's like with someone stomping on the grapes in a wine press, the blood's going to squirt up to the horse's bridle for a period of 184 miles, or a distance of 184 miles. Now, if you're stepping on grapes that are just a foot off the ground and they're squirting up about three feet to the horse's bridle, that's some heavy stomping. And it just pictures the vengeance of Christ coming when He returns. And so it's going to engulf the, the whole land of Israel when, when the campaign of Armageddon takes place. Now, as these forces are gathered there at Armageddon, to annihilate the Jewish people once and for all, they're going to see something in the sky. It says they're going to see the sign of the Son of Man. Now, I don't know exactly what that is, but it could be the Shekinah glory of God. But something's going to catch their attention as they're, they're gathered there all throughout the whole land of Israel, uh, starting at Armageddon and, and kind of radiating out from there. And what they're going to see is the sign of the Son of Man, and when they see Jesus coming at His second coming, they're going to turn against Him in unison. And what's going to happen then is the greatest event in human history, uh, the, the glorious second coming of Jesus Christ. It's the, it's the event all of history is headed towards. It's the crescendo of the ages. So at that point in time, the scroll will be opened. The seven seals will have been opened. The seventh seal contained the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet contained the seventh bowl. It's all opened. And Jesus now is coming back, and He's coming back to take the inheritance, to take the inheritance that Adam and Eve lost, to come back and, and, and make uh, this world what it's supposed to be. Now, when you think about it, the whole Bible can be summarized in three statements about Jesus. Jesus is coming. Jesus has come, and Jesus is coming again. The Old Testament's Jesus is coming. The time we live in now is Jesus has come, and now it's Jesus is coming again. It's the great consummation of all the ages. And of course, the most complete account of this is in Revelation chapter 19. And I just want to mention quickly three things about the coming of Jesus. 
The first thing is that Jesus Christ, when He comes back at the end of the seven-year tribulation, He's coming back visibly. He's coming back visibly. Notice in in, uh, Revelation 19, 11, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, he who sat upon it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, his head's many diadems. He has a name written upon himself that nobody knows but he himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. He's coming back visibly. All the way back to the beginning of Revelation, Revelation 1 7. It says, Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Even so, amen. You say, well, how's everybody going to see him? Because if, you know, you live on one side of the earth and he's coming back, it's day, and the other side it's night, and so people have wondered, how's everybody going to see uh, Jesus? Well, certainly he could project it around the world, right? I mean, uh, we have pretty good technology nowadays. I'm sure he can project it where everybody can see it. But Dr. John Walford, who was at Dallas Seminary, the president there, and of course Dr. Evans knew him well. I was talking with Dr. Walvard one time at lunch and was talking about this, and he said, you know, it may be that the second coming will last for 24 hours. In other words, the earth will rotate all the way around it. It's going to be like a slow train that's coming out there that people see coming to the earth. Now, if that's true, you talk about dramatic. I mean, you talk about freaking people out. But the, the tragedy of it is seeing that the people on earth are still going to turn against Jesus and fight against Him, rather than turning, uh, bowing down on their faces uh, before Him. But the point I want to make here is this coming of Jesus is does not spiritual or symbolic. It is a literal, visible coming. Jesus came literally the first time to Bethlehem. He's going to come literally the second time. The angel, when he went to heaven, says this same Jesus that you see going to, into heaven is going to come back in a like manner as you've seen Him go. By the way, that's just an important point to remember. Did you know there are about a thousand prophecies in the Bible? About 500 of those prophecies have been fulfilled, and there's 500 yet to be fulfilled. Now, that's quite a track record. I mean, 500 fulfilled prophecies, and all the prophecies that have been fulfilled have been literally fulfilled. So we can know the ones that haven't been fulfilled, they will be literally fulfilled as well. Jesus is coming back literally and visibly. He's not going to come back the second time riding on a donkey like He did the first time. He's going to be astride a a milk-white stallion, the symbol of a, a conquering king, of a man of war. And He's coming back as a conquering, unconquerable king. So Jesus is coming back visibly. He's also coming back vengefully. The emphasis in Revelation 19 is on judgment. Jesus is coming back to judge the world for its sin as they've gathered against Him. 2 Thessalonians 1.7 says He's going to be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire. Now, the idea of judgment's not popular today. It never has been, but it's certainly not now. But this isn't some arbitrary act by an irrational deity. This is a holy God bringing a just end to a world that has rejected Him. And he comes back, he's called faithful and true. He keeps his promises. He's got a secret name that nobody knows, and that tells us we're going to learn things about Jesus for eternity. He's called the Word of God. He's the one who reveals God and gives full expression to Him. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he comes back with a robe dipped in blood, and some people think this is the blood he shed at Calvary, but I don't think it's his own blood. I think it's the blood of his enemies that he's going to shed. Now, one of the most exciting things about this, verse 14 of chapter 19, the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, are following Him on white horses. Now, you know who that is? It's us. (laughs) We're coming back with Him. By the way, that's another argument for the pre-trib rapture, because if we're going to come back with Him and we've already been rewarded, then we have to have been in heaven before that, right? So we have to have been caught up to heaven to have been rewarded there and been presented to Christ as His bride to come back uh, with Him. Um, I've got a a slide here. I just, you all probably talked about this before, but, you know, when we talk about the rapture before the tribulation and the return at the end, we're not talking about two second comings. You know, a lot of people accuse those of us who believe in the pre-trib rapture, they'll say, well, you believe in three comings. You know, Christ came the first time, then the rapture will be the second coming, and then the return will be the third coming. 
We don't believe in three comings. We believe that that, that Christ is coming back in two phases, the rapture and the return. Just like think about Christ's first coming. There were phases, right? His birth, His life, His death, three days later, His resurrection, 40 days later, His ascension. So it had phases to it that were separated by time. And so the second coming of Christ is going to have phases. But they're different from one another because notice that the rapture, he comes in the air. At the return, he comes back to earth. The rapture, we go meet him in the air. But the destination's different. He's going to come to earth. He's going to come back to the Mount of Olives where he left. And I like what one of my old friends used to say. He's going to make make a perfect two-point landing on the Mount of Olives. And the Bible tells us in Zechariah 14, it's going to split in half. But at the rapture, He comes for His saints. At the return, He comes with His saints. We're coming with Him. Um, At the rapture, believers depart. At the return, unbelievers depart. They're going to be sent away. At the rapture, He claims His bride. At the return, He comes with His bride. Um, at At the rapture, He comes to reward, to take us to heaven to reward us. At the return, He's coming to judge. The rapture's not in the Old Testament. It was a mystery, whereas the return is mentioned often in the Old Testament. Um, Also, the rapture doesn't have any signs. There's no signs for the rapture. It can happen at any moment. There's a lot of signs for the second coming of Christ. Now, think about this. If the rapture has to come before the return, and the signs are for the return, not the rapture, if we can already see the signs of the return and the rapture hasn't happened yet, what does that mean? The rapture is pretty close. So, the signs we see are for the return. We're already seeing them now, and the rapture hasn't even taken place yet. The rapture is going to be a, an event of blessing and comfort to return's judgment. Uh, at, at the rapture, Christ is going to come in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the return, it's going to be visible to the whole world. Every eye will see Him. At the rapture, the re- tribulation begins not long after that. At the return, then the millennium uh, will begin. So these are two different events. Uh, I heard about a Christian woman once who was talking to a pastor about the assurance of salvation. She said, I have a one-way ticket to glory, and I don't intend to come back. Well, the pastor said, you're sure going to miss a lot. I've taken a round-trip ticket. I'm not only going to meet Christ in glory, I'm coming back with Him in power and great glory to the earth. And that's true. We have a round-trip ticket. We're going to go up at the rapture before the tribulation, and we're going to come back with Him um, at the return. And just imagine what it will be like to follow the King of kings and Lord of lords and lead the mighty angels in flaming fire as God the Almighty comes back to take over. We'll have a front row seat to all of this that's happening. So Jesus is coming visibly, He's coming vengefully, and He's also coming victoriously. Jesus will return as King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming back to take over. As all these armies are amassed there to meet him. But you know what's fascinating is there's never a record here in Revelation 19 of any struggle. It says, verse 19, I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, their armies assembled to make war with the one who sat upon the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who'd received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire. By the way, two men went to heaven without dying in the Old Testament, right? Enoch and Elijah. Here there's two men that go straight to hell without dying, the beast and the false prophet or the Antichrist and the false prophet. And the rest were killed with the sword that came out of Jesus' mouth. The sword there pictures His his words, His speech. Him who sat upon the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. I remember when I was in class at Dallas Seminary years ago, Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost He'd sit there behind his desk, and he just kind of, his, only his head was sticking up. Is all you could see there as he was teaching. And he got to this passage, and he said, all Jesus is going to have to do when he comes back is just say, drop dead, and it's going to all be over. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. I mean, it's not going to be a battle. I mean, Jesus is coming back, Daniel 2 says, as a smiting stone. He's going to be the son of man in Daniel chapter 7. Psalm 2 says he's going to dash the nations like someone uh, dashes a potter's vessel, like a bunch of pottery. Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to vanquish his enemies. And so we live today in a fading kingdom. We're looking for a final kingdom that's coming. And Jesus is king today over all the the petty kings and kingdoms that rule today that uh, instill fear in so many people. 
you know, Vladimir Putin and President Xi of China and Kim Jong-un and the Ayatollah in Iran. Back on uh, October the 16th of 1946, the Nazi war criminals at the end of the Nuremberg trial, they were finally uh, executed. They were, they were, uh, each one of them were hung. And um, they cremated their bodies and they put them all in an urn and they were driven out into the Bavarian countryside. And here's what one man says, after an hour's drive, the vehicle stopped and the ashes were poured into a muddy ditch. Five or six years earlier, these men dominated and intimidated the world. That night a drizzle washed them away. That's what's going to happen to the powers of this world someday. It says in Daniel chapter 2, Jesus will smite this image and it will blow away like chaff. Back in uh, the days of the Emperor Julian, he, he hated Christ, the, the Roman Emperor Julian. He was mortally wounded in a war. While his expedition was in progress, one of Julian's followers asked a Christian in Antioch what the carpenter's son was doing. The Christian replied, the maker of the world, whom you call the carpenter's son, is employed in making a coffin for your emperor. <laughs> Within days, it says, news came of Julian's death. And the author says this, Jesus has a coffin for every empire and emperor. The only true security is in the kingdom of the carpenter's son. That's the only security we have. He's coming back to rule and reign and to take over and to conquer. Look, history's headed to the feet of Jesus. So you and I might as well get a head start and start living our lives there now. Well, let me close and just mention four quick applications for us. They all start with R. Here's the first one, be rejoicing. Be rejoicing. You say, man, after hearing about all this, who wants to rejoice? Well, if you know Christ, you can rejoice that you're not going to have to endure the tribulation period. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 1 tells us that, that we're to be waiting up for His Son from heaven, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. He keeps us from the hour of testing that's coming upon the whole earth. So we need to be rejoicing that we're going to be delivered from that time, and we need to be rejoicing that we know what's coming. It's a great thing to know where this world's headed, isn't it? And God knows the future. I remember reading one time about a man who went to visit a psychic and on the door, there was a sign that said, closed due to unforeseen circumstances. <laughs> you know, there's no unforeseen circumstances with God. There's never panic in heaven. There's only plans. I mean, the, the Trinity never meets in emergency session. God knows the future, and God's told us what's coming. It gives us confidence and peace. Uh, years ago, my family and I had the opportunity. It was a, one of the best trips we've had. Um, I went to Oklahoma State. So did my wife, uh, my two sons. And they made it finally to a, 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 a big, big-time bowl, the Fiesta Bowl, back in 2012. So we went out there to, the, to Arizona and got a house and rented the house and had a lot of fun there. Well, we went to the game, and um, we get to the game, and, and uh, one son and myself, my wife calls us pessimists. We call ourselves realists. But uh, we got behind, Oklahoma State did, we were playing Andrew Luck. You remember Andrew Luck at Stanford? And we got behind 14 to 3, and we were both saying, well, it's been a good trip. We're going to get beat. You know, we're kind of negative about it. And anyway, the game goes back and forth. At the end of the game, um, Stanford's driving down. They're just wasting time to kick a field goal to win the game. And so time's running out. This guy comes out there, and I mean, he just pushes this kick to the right horribly. And uh, we, uh, we, it goes to overtime. Now, during this whole time, by the way, the Stanford band is the most uh, uh, annoying group of people on, on planet Earth. So I was hoping we would beat Stanford just for their, to get, their band, get at their band. But, um, so we go into overtime, and in overtime, Stanford gets the ball. And they have it first, and they can't score a touchdown, so they try a field goal again. This time, the guy hooks the thing way to the left. So OSU gets the ball, they score a touchdown, and we won the game. I mean, it was just, it was unbelievable, you know, the celebration we had. So we go back to this house we're staying at, and uh, we're getting get sandwiches up, eating chips and stuff, and just having a big old time. And we turn on ESPN, and the game we had just watched that, that we'd been at was now on ESPN. They were just showing the kickoff. Well, this time, me and my other realist son, we're watching the game, and we're totally relaxed, man. We're having a great time, man. We're just watching the game. We're not nervous at all, and whatever. It's just wonderful watching this game. We don't care how far behind they are. Now, why do we feel so good about it? Because we know how it ends, right? So we go to bed at, you know, turn off the TV finally 2 in the morning or something, and my wife, of course, wants to keep watching. I said, look, we know how it ends. Let's turn this off and, and go to sleep. But 
knowing how it ends gives us confidence and gives us calm and gives us courage uh, to meet the challenges uh, that, that you and I face in life. So the first thing I would just say is be rejoicing. Secondly, be receiving. Be receiving. Look, Jesus came the first time as a lamb. He's coming back as a lion. And if you've never received Jesus Christ, you need to do that. Um, Jesus is coming for those who've come to Him. If you've never come to Jesus, He's not coming for you. He's coming for people who have come to Him. And you can come to Him. The Bible says, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So come to Him if you've never done that tonight and, and receive Him. A third thing I'd say is be reaching. We all know people who don't know Christ. And certainly if they don't know the Lord, they're going to spend eternity separated from Him in hell. But they may also spend uh, time in the tribulation period if Jesus comes. We need to be reaching out and witnessing and helping other people escape the wrath that's coming. Uh, there's a, a story I read years ago about C.T. Studd. Some of you may, may know who he is. He's a famous missionary, a great cricket player, wealthy, gave all his money away, went to China. But the story's told that uh, he came back to London and he was preaching, and his cousin um, asked him to stay in her home with her and her husband. And he said, I'll stay with you on one condition you would come listen to me preach. So she came to listen to him. And during his sermon, he made the comment that becoming a Christian and knowing the gospel is like getting a bad case of smallpox. Because he said, whenever you get it, it spreads. You spread it to others. Well, driving home that night, she was really upset with him that he would use smallpox to equate with the gospel. She wasn't a Christian and uh, got really on him. So the next night, she came and listened to him uh, preach again. And that night when they got home, she came over and was offering him some tea, and he wasn't listening to her. She kept talking to him and offering him his tea, and finally she said, why aren't you listening to me? And he looked at her and he said, you're doing the same thing that I'm doing to you. You're doing the same thing to God. God wants to give you eternal life, and you're not listening to Him. So it pierced her heart, and so that night he went back to London, and the next day he got a telegraph from her. She said, got a case of the smallpox and got it bad. <clears throat> And, you know, we've just come out of COVID and all. Let me just say this. When it comes to the gospel, we need to be super spreaders. We need to be super spreaders of the gospel. There's people all around us you work with, people in your family, people that you know who do not know Jesus Christ. And this is their fate. They're going to be in the tribulation and ultimately separated from God. So let's be super spreaders. Finally, I just say this, be readying be readying your life for the coming of Christ. Look, the, the, the signs today are lighting up like runway lights as the coming of Christ uh, is, is approaching. Again, Israel's in the land. There's all this movement today for peace in the Middle East. We see the increasing globalism. You know, we see uh, nations like Russia and Iran that are predicted to invade Israel in Ezekiel chapter 38. You and I need to live today with a sense of urgency we need to be energized and, and get up every day and say, perhaps today's the day that Christ could come, and to live uh, with that sense of urgency for Him and make your life count. I'll close with this. This is one of my favorite stories. It's a, a story about Annie Oakley. Some of you may know who Annie Oakley is. She was known as Little Sure Shot. She was uh, an incredible shot with a rifle or a pistol, and she was actually the first female superstar in, uh, really in, in, uh, in acting. She was part of uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, and Buffalo Bill's Wild West show went over to Europe in the late 1900s and was a huge, the late uh, 1800s, and was a big hit there. Well, they went to uh, Berlin in 1899, and Annie Oakley could, you know, hold a mirror and shoot targets far away over her shoulder. You could throw up a playing card, she could shoot it out of the air. You could throw a coin in the air and she could shoot it. I mean, she was an incredible shot. And one of the parts of her act was she'd ask for a volunteer from the audience to come and put a lit cigar in their mouth, and from 25 yards away with a 45 pistol, she'd shoot the ashes off the end of the cigar. Well, most of the time, nobody would volunteer, so her husband was in the audience, and he would volunteer if nobody else did. His name was Frank Butler. Now, by the way, I bet he treated her really well. I mean, I, you, know, you get shooting these ashes off of there. But, but that time, they're, they're in Germany, and Kaiser Wilhelm volunteers to come up and be the one to put the cigar in his mouth. So he's the Kaiser of Germany, comes up there, has this big lit cigar, these ashes on the end. She takes aim with her pistol and shoots the ashes off the end of the cigar. Well, a few years later, 15 years later, Kaiser Wilhelm plunges the world into World War I. 
and all the carnage of that war. And the story goes that Annie Oakley sent a letter to Kaiser Wilhelm, and in that letter she asked him if she could have another shot. Now, we don't know what his response ever was from that, but I love that story because it reminds you and me of a very important truth in light of all these sobering things we've talked about here this evening, and that is you only get one shot at life. You and I get one shot. That's all we get. There's no dress rehearsal. There's no mulligans. There's no do-overs. We get one shot at life, and you and I need to make sure that we make that one shot count. And so I pray that you'll do that in these days ahead as you think about the the Word of God and especially about these prophetic truths. You'll get up every day and take dead aim with your life and make sure that your life uh, counts for all of eternity. Well, let's pray together. Well, Father, we come before you now. We just thank you for the prophetic Word. You tell us that you've given us the prophetic Word. It's like a light shining in a dark place, whereunto we do well to take heed till the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. Father, thank you for a sure word of prophecy that you've given to us. We can know that these things we've studied here this evening will come true. Father, we thank you for the testimony of Jesus, that that's the spirit of prophecy. Father, keep us focused on Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah who's coming again. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for Dr. Evans. Thank you for the the ministry you've given to him and what a gift and a blessing he is to the body of Christ. Pray for your good and gracious hand, Father, to to rest upon him and upon the leaders of this church. And I thank you for these dear people who've come out tonight uh, to spend this time uh, with me in fellowship and in the Word of God. Now, Father, move us, energize us. Father, help each one of us as we leave here tonight to leave here committed to make our one shot at life count, to take dead aim with our life, and to make it count, Father, for you and for all eternity, for you're worthy. We commit ourselves to you now and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Thank you for letting me be here with you tonight.